Good evening, um, everybody. My name is Ilyas and I'm the um, founder of Cambridge Quantum and I'm also the chief executive of Quantinuum. Continuum is the name of the company that is the result of the merger between Cambridge Quantum and Honeywell Quantum Solutions. The merger itself was announced late last year in uh, December. Well, actually, the merger intention was announced in the middle of last year, 2021, and was completed in December uh, of last year. Uh, my background is that I was um, the chairman of the Stephen Hawking Foundation. Stephen was uh, a friend of mine, and um, towards the end of his life, he was very interested in a lot of different things, and one of them was the quantum uh, computing uh, process. And it was a combination of my um, exposure to Stephen and his thoughts on this uh, topic, as well as my being one of the founders of something called Accelerate Cambridge. And Accelerate Cambridge was and is now still a, uh, a very successful accelerator program for commercializing deep science in the Cambridge cluster. Some of you may be aware that the University of Cambridge and the area around Cambridge has produced some really successful startups, companies which have come out of the university. But our um, success in deep science, I'm going now back to 2011, 2012, in those days, that was not quite as successful. And so the idea of Accelerate Cambridge was to try and really um, create the environment in which deep science companies could also prosper. So that was my background and Cambridge Quantum was founded in uh, 2014 as one of the earliest companies in quantum computing. And we were established for a variety of reasons that I'll, uh, I'll touch upon later. And the journey of Cambridge Quantum from then till now is pretty well documented. Uh, for those of you who are interested in things like that, there's a lot of the information already on the, um, on the internet. So before I start, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity of speaking to you. I'd like to thank Ahmed for introducing me uh, to the idea of this talk and then beyond that uh, inviting me and it's a great pleasure and I hope that there's something beneficial in our talk today. I'm going to speak for maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes and then uh, hopefully we can have enough time for question and answer. I'm not the host of this, I'm not in control of the, uh, of the technology so I'm assuming that we prefer questions at the end rather than questions now. Um, so I'm just going to start by giving some context. I'd like all of you to imagine what this revolution in technology means for the whole of humanity. And I would further ask you to think that whatever you can imagine is not enough. It is my view and it is increasingly the view of many people around the world that the impact of quantum technologies will be greater than any other development in any technology at any time in the history of humanity. These are big words, and perhaps they are words that we don't fully understand. But let me give you some examples of why I might say that. I'm now going to be 60 in my next birthday. In my lifetime, I have never seen something where nation states, China, the United States, Japan, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, has adopted a single technology and created vast resources towards the industrialization and commercialization of that single technology. There's a congressional bill in the United States, no less, a congressional bill. The amount of money that is being spent in research and development in France and Germany and the United Kingdom and China is unlike any other single technology. This tells you something. But then beyond that, large organizations like Microsoft and Google and Amazon and many others have decided that they must have a quantum strategy. 
And then recently over the course, particularly of the last one year, organizations that would be consumers of this technology, users of this technology, have started to realize that in their current business plans, and remember if you're a large organization, if you are a global organization, even if you're a local organization, your business plan is normally three, four, five, eight years. You don't make plans for one day or two. And during the next three to five years, it's likely that quantum technologies will have an impact on what you're doing. Now, those of you who are familiar with what's been happening also will understand that actually these impacts have a profound, profound influence on the way we live our lives. I personally think that a quantum computer will help us uncover some of the most fundamental mysteries that currently exist in science. It's not just about the impact on business, but of course, the impact on business is a nice way, an easy way to see things. Everybody understands money, it's a global currency. Some say it's maybe too much of an influence. I think it's a great leveler. I think quantum computing has the opportunity to democratize development. Why do I say that? There is no single country that is in charge. Since the end of the Second World War, we have been in an environment where the United States and Europe have led technological development. In quantum computing, that is not the case. You're listening to me from Egypt. There's no reason for Egypt not to be a leader in this industrial revolution. No reason whatsoever. Now, we at Continuum, our company, is the largest of the quantum computing companies at the moment. And we accelerate the development of products because we believe that we are now within touching distance. I'm not saying tomorrow or the day after, but I'm saying that over the course of the next few years, these products will have impact and we are accelerating their development. Now, when I say we're the largest company, that obviously didn't happen overnight. The, um, the story of quantum computing from the time that Yuri Manin and David Deutsch and, uh, and Feynman started thinking about these things way back in the 1980s is primarily a journey of aspiration and vision and ambition, but not engineering progress. Now, in Honeywell, which is a large um, American conglomerate, deep within their aerospace division, they were incubating the development of a quantum processor hardware. And that journey for them started in 2011, when they realized that actually they were very good at these trapped iron devices because they had the machine tools and they had the expertise and the uh, control systems. And that's when they started their journey. We at Cambridge Quantum, as I said before, started in 2014. Our companies merged last year, and today there are about 400 people in our company. We're in the United States, we are in Europe, in Germany, and uh, the United Kingdom, and we're also in Japan. And who knows, perhaps uh, maybe one day in Egypt as well. Um, what I want to try and do is give you a sense, uh, Emma asked me to focus on, on reality rather than um, some sort of a tutorial. You don't need a tutorial from me. I think many of you uh, have as much, if not more information uh, and knowledge than I have. So I'm going to cover these areas. What we do is um, we, we, we have a very integrated approach and a comprehensive approach to the way in which quantum computing can be used. And of course, we have the hardware and we have the middleware and we have applications. But essentially, what you see on this screen is going to be my agenda um, for the next few moments. Now, the reason why I'm going to take that approach is that the agenda lends itself to some relationship with the reality of life. In life, we confront things that we use, we consume, we utilize in these different areas. Some of them are very big, they're important for the future of the planet, such as carbon storage and carbon sequestration. Obviously, 
pharma and healthcare and cybersecurity and fertilizer production, of course. These are the areas in which we are developing product. And these products are at different stages of development for two reasons. One, because the devices, the, the computers themselves are still developing and there is a lack of definition about exactly what type of computer will work. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But at the same time, the algorithm development has only just started because it's only in the last couple of years that we have actual real machines that we can use. Now, I'm going to very quickly um, comment on the question of machines. Uh, many of you will understand that there are many different types of quantum processors. Ultimately, what is a quantum processor? It is a device that generates something physical, a qubit. The qubit might be a photon, it might be a superconducting qubit, it might be a trapped ion, it might be a neutral atom. Whatever the physical instantiation, a quantum computer first has to generate the qubit. That qubit then has to be manipulated through these logic gates. And these are the ways in which we manipulate information that is embedded in the qubit. And ultimately, of course, we have to measure the result. So the generation of a qubit, its manipulation, and then its subsequent measurement is the way that we think about the computer. And there are people who think that the only way to do this is a photonic device, for example, and they're maniacally focused on that, and they think that's the only right way. And then next to them, there may be somebody who says, well, you know what? We have to do this using a superconducting method. And that's the only way. And around the world, there are at least 150 companies and organizations that have built or are building a quantum computer. And I think probably the right number might even be closer to 200. And each one of them thinks that their computer is the best. And each one of them divided into these different categories think that their category is the only way to do it. Imagine 100 years ago having so many ways of building a combustion engine and everybody saying, no, ours is the best. We don't know. We don't know which one will be the best. We at Continuum are platform neutral. We have our own device. It's a very good device. It's currently the world's most powerful device as measured by quantum volume. But we also are an IBM quantum hub. We use superconducting qubits. We also have collaborations with photonic devices. We also are working with other neutral atom and cold atom people. So we look at the waterfront. Now, for the next eight to 10 minutes, or maybe 10 to 12 minutes, I'm going to skip through our um, products and what we actually do. The first one I want to talk about is quantum origin. This is the first time that a real product has been devised by a quantum computer where a quantum computer today, which doesn't need to get any better, does something which a classical computer cannot. And this is to generate a key which is seeded in a manner which is non-deterministic, so there's no algorithm, and therefore it is impossible to hack or compromise. Now, if you imagine the cybersecurity system as being this pyramid, and the base level of the pyramid is going to be the security of the key, the sanctity of the key. If we can make sure that that layer is impregnable, we are making a huge advance in the way that we secure our communications and our data, our personal data, our corporate data, our governmental data. The way we do it is not um, vulnerable to a quantum computer. So this is a revolution. This is something that was announced very recently. There's a lot of information about it. If some of you are cryptographers and interested in the way we do this, if you're interested in the way that quantum keys are going to be generated, I don't mean quantum key uh, distributors, not QKD, but I mean actual keys seeded by a quantum source, then this is something that you can find out a lot about. There are papers on this, the lead paper was by Fernando Brandao, 
uh, at Caltech, there's a lot of information on this, but this is our first product. The next area I want to, oh, by the way, I just, um, um, when I use the word product, I mean this is real and can be used today. So there are some uh, examples here of companies and entities that are now actually using this. So the next time somebody says to you, oh, hey, quantum computing is a decade away, you look at them and you can smile and you can say, I'm sorry, you are misinformed. It is real and it is today. So these um, uh, use cases are generated at the moment from our own quantum computer, but we could generate this from an IBM computer or many other computers, uh, quantum computers. I'm moving on quickly because I also want to cover some other areas. At Continuum, and before that it used to be um, uh, Cambridge Quantum, we developed this rather amazing compiler that became the most advanced quantum software development platform. It is open source. It is extremely popular amongst university based developers. It is a very large global ecosystem. At the heart of it, Ticket was a compiler, but it's now way more than that. There's a routing mechanism. It is platform agnostic. We support 13 or 14 different platforms immediately and another eight or nine um, indirectly. It is the most widely used um, uh, software development platform for quantum computing anywhere. It is a complement to places like Qiskit, that is the IBM language. It is a complement to many, many, many others. Why? Why is it a complement? Because it makes them faster, tangibly, empirically, provably faster. All the results are published and you can find this very easily on there's a GitHub resource. Those of you that are interested, some of you might even be using it. This is based on the ZX um, calculus and it is a thing of real beauty. Uh, and we open sourced it last uh, last year, I think in September or October. Now, Ticket itself um, is at the heart of a development that Emma was asking me about uh, earlier, which is ultimately going to be an operating system. We're a little bit careful about how we use the terminology there, but a way of thinking about this is that at some point during summer, a true operating system will emerge. Why do I say true operating system? Remember, in order for there to be such an operating system, the computer has to be ready for it. Things like mid-circuit measurement, things like um, dynamic error correction, things like logical qubits that are not extortionately expensive. These things are coming together in the quantum uh, computer that is the trapped iron device that we have, the H series. And so look forward to that over the course of summer. Those of you who are interested will find this a major step forward in the commercialization of quantum computers. We also have a presence in uh, artificial intelligence. Um, obviously, this is one of the most uh, promising areas. Today's artificial intelligence, machine learning is opaque. It is expensive. It is prone to bias. It is approximate. You know, people get very excited by trivial use cases. You all know as computer scientists that there's a long way to go. And we believe, like many others, that a quantum inspired and quantum powered artificial intelligence paradigm will shift fundamentally what can and cannot be done. Our team is based in Oxford, lots of publications. I would encourage you to um, look at them. We think about this world in two ways. We look at machine learning exercises. And in this area, there is a gradual migration of companies, large companies, who are beginning to experiment for the first time. They're allocating budget. They're spending money and looking at proof of concepts in machine learning for optimization and related areas, but particularly also now in material discovery. So that's one part of what we do with applications in finance, in pharmacology, in hydrocarbon extraction, also in logistics. The other part of what we do, and this is a big, big, big project, it's my, one of my favorite projects, and I, you know, we don't have time today to deep, uh, deeply dive into this. You know, language processing 
if you can, if, if, if a quantum or if any computer could process language in a meaning aware manner, we have got real artificial intelligence. Nothing today comes close. Nothing today comes close. You know, when we say to Siri or Alexa, what time is it? This is not language processing. Text recognition is trivial. Um, uh, speech to text conversion. This is not the, the computer doesn't know what we're talking about. It has no understanding. And in fact, we when we start having language in the sense of whole conversations or books rather than two or three words, that's when we get to, to language. And this is a big project. And again, if you're interested in this, we have a lot of publications and some videos as well. Um, a few months, uh, a few weeks ago, rather, we um, in the public domain had an open source development kit for quantum natural language processing. It's called Lambeck. Please feel free to download it, play with it. It's a thing of beauty. It really is quantum native, and that's why it works. And I'm just going to finish with quantum chemistry. Um, I don't have a slide on that um, on its own, but if you look in the middle column here, human is the word that we use to describe our efforts in material discovery from first principles, um, ab initio calculations. This is something, of course, which has been discussed for many decades as being the primary reason why a quantum computer matters. Quantum systems can only be simulated using quantum computers. This, of course, was the insight of Feynman back in 1980 and 81. His famous paper, which is obviously available on the Internet today, talks about his motivation. We have a very significant um, quantum chemistry team. Um, it, it's the largest um, quantum chemistry team, uh, I believe, of any organization. It's based mainly out of Cambridge. We're involved in looking at materials in drugs, in refrigerants, in carbon sequestration, and many other areas as well. Again, if you are interested in this area, we have a lot of publications. We have some videos as well from the website. Please feel free to, to, to visit. And I think, Emmett, I'm on time and I'm going to stop the screen share now if I can, because we can then go to um, Q&A. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Elias, very, very much for, for this inspiring talk. Um, uh, actually, I, I have many questions, but I will wait uh, if uh, if our audience have any question, please raise your hand or you can write your question uh, on the chat. OK, until they prepare their question. Um, OK, they prepare their question. <laughs> ah, OK. OK, so uh, our first question. So okay, can you see the chat? Uh, our first question, you might be familiar with technology. Uh, type curve. Where do you think uh, quantum computers is today? Um, yeah, look, I think we're very, very, very far away from hype. I mean, um, you know, I get this question a lot. Um, most people who are involved in quantum computing, Emmett, like you, for example, it's impossible to hype. I mean, <laughs> there are the informed consensus around the world is so tightly knit and the ability to, to distinguish right from wrong and feasible from unfeasible experimental results from uh, fiction, it, it, it really is very difficult. And most of the people who are the customers, they are very well informed. So, for example, one of our customers is Total, you know, the, 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 the global hydrocarbon extraction company, energy company. Another one of our clients is Roche, the big pharmaceutical company. They were a client. It is impossible to have hype in order to get them to spend money. They are more informed, as well informed as anybody. So I would encourage um, people just to be a little bit uh, measured on this uh, thing. Now, of course, 
in the in the general public, um, there are people who will uh, who are not that well informed. And it's a bit like cold fusion. Remember, Emmett, for <laughs> three, four, five decades. We, so uh, maybe in the early days of the Internet as well, and especially when business gets involved, people want to buy and sell shares and this and that and the other. But this is marginal, marginal. If you look at what's happening, this is geopolitical, this is nation state developed. In our company, we have 400 people, 300 and something of them are scientists. I think we have almost 200 PhDs. If I said something, which is hype, if I said something, and this is gonna be on YouTube, my scientists will resign, right? They'll say, I'm not working here. So I would just be a little bit um, cautious on the use of the word uh, hype. Now, when we talk about the technology hype curve, people who are consultants, McKinsey, Boston Consulting, blah, 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 they've got this very nice chart. It goes like this. And they track things like, you know, I don't know, the machine learning and artificial intelligence and internet and mobile telephony. And what they're looking at is expectation and reality of product. In the, in the quantum computing space, I don't know of anybody who thinks that a quantum computer will solve a problem tomorrow. And the big companies have published roadmaps. If you go to the IBM website, they will tell you what their roadmap is. If you go to our website, we tell you the roadmap. Google, right? The, the CEO of Google said that he expects fault tolerant devices around about 2029. IBM said that they expect some quantum advantage in 2024, 23, 24. Now, these were in the public domain. As long as you've got eyes and you can see and you can go on the internet, you don't need hype. The, 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 these are well-established facts. And moreover, if you go to the website of the UK National Quantum Technologies Program or the US program, the German program, for example, there are ample published discussion documents, briefing documents, papers measuring where we are. So we don't have to guess. We are equipped to make our own rational decisions. I can't hear um, you. You're mute. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much for for this answer. This very good answer. Um, that it, it means that you you got this question a lot, so you prepared very good for this answer. <laughs> well, I mostly get it from uh, investors and bankers and money people. You know, yeah. they're the ones that get excited. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, we have another question. Uh, how to overcome the learning curve fast? I think this is classical question in in um, these talks. Um, um, so uh, Itamar is looking for guide resources to write and test algorithms for real world applications. So is, this is the same person asking yes, two people yes, the question. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I think that the um, you know, there are a number of resources that, that are out there. I'm assuming that the person Ithmar, is already um, uh, competent in understanding uh, uh, quantum computing. Right? I, I'm assuming that. So I would say that there are two parts to this. I hope I got it right. The first part is that, you know, not just in quantum computing, but genuine innovative algorithms, even in normal computer science, classical computer science, are very hard. I mean, if you look over the last 70 years of classical computing, most algorithms are derivatives of existing major breakthroughs. So in quantum algorithms, if, Ithmar, you are able to come up with a new algorithm, you will be a superstar. You, you, you will be very, very, very rich as well. Um, this is very hard. So it, we cannot trivialize it. 
I have many people in my company, and then you look at universities and you look at large companies, it's very hard. Um, I would say that maybe the question therefore is more about testing. And I would say Ticket, if you can download and use Ticket, there are so many tutorials, there's a global support group, there's a global network, and you can really advance very quickly. And you can start with existing algorithms that you can see how they get compiled, and then you can move into other areas. The other point I would make is that recently there have been three or four excellent books. Um, if you're interested in this, then I would recommend Bob's book, Bob Kuka, C-O-E-C-K-E. -E. Um, that particular uh, book with Alex Kissinger converts the um, traditional methodology into a diagrammatic process. It's very intuitive. They're a little bit like Feynman diagrams. I think that is a major resource. And of course, there's many, many, many YouTube videos about him. That might be uh, interesting for you. Actually, this, this will lead me to, um, to my first question. Um, uh, you know, to, to, to disseminate the technology, to, to get people to know the technology, uh, and since you are a very big company, uh, why uh, you didn't think to integrate, to provide materials that can be used in in education in universities like other companies for example i teach course in quantum computing and i uh, uh, if i have tools that can be used in the education process uh, uh, with the material uh, this will help the students the young students to to know the technology and in the future they will get addicted to this technology uh, i don't want to name certain companies that can, that do this but they are successful in this they yeah, yeah. do certificates, they have materials. Uh, the publicity is, is very important. So what's your plan in your company about this? Well, well, first of all, we're not very big. We're only 400 people. I mean, <laughs> we're not very big, not yet. Um, no, I think that it, it's a fair question. It's a fair question. So our approach to this is a little bit different, Emmett. Our approach is that we, we made Ticket open source, right? This is our one of our big contributions. We made Lambeck open source. This is a big contribution. We also um, have um, this, um, you know, the I don't know how familiar you are with it, the ZX calculus. We sponsor that um, uh, project and, and it, it's totally open source. I also was behind compositionality, you know, the, the Diamond Ax, uh, Open Access uh, Journal. And so in these ways, we we think is more effective than just PR, because if you look, I mean, I like what IBM does uh, with Qiskit, uh, et cetera, but it's got very limited applicability, very limited. Uh, it's very good. Ticket makes it better. So we prefer to be at the much more hardcore side rather than the, 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 the PR side. What I will say is that later on this year, I don't know whether it's going to be summer or autumn, Ahmed, we are publishing a book which will be for educational purposes that will bring this together, but not yet. We're still a small company. You know, uh, we're 400 people. Uh, I think IBM has 100,000 people. Um, <laughs> so we're still a small company. But, but, but yeah, I think taking this approach is very important for the dissemination and the publicity, we will get adopted, get I, used to the technology. Uh, this is very, very, very important. So no, I, 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 I think. I agree. I, so agree. I, I think we have another question. Uh, now, by having customers, uh, does a company make uh, revenue, profit, or still for operating on the pilot project with customer like Total? Um, so it's a big question and it's a good question. Um, so I, first of all, I would say that most quantum computing companies are similar to where, let's say, internet companies would have been in 1996, 97, 98. I think that's kind of a good analogy. Like all analogies, it, it's not 100% accurate, but generally it's a good analogy. Now, in our case, um, all pilots, all pilot projects or proof of concept projects, they are paying, they're not for free. 
So people do pay and we do have revenues. Of course, we're not profitable. I don't think anybody will be profitable for a few years. But this is the world's biggest market. I think so today, I think the world's biggest company might be Apple, I think. And Apple might have a market cap of, I don't know, two two trillion or something. I mean, these are in, incredible numbers. You know, Apple's market value is bigger than the economy of virtually most countries. But I think in 20 years time, maybe even earlier, the biggest companies in the world will be quantum computing companies. And that is because the, um, the addressable markets are so large because there are new markets. We are doing things which previously was not possible. In our company's case, um, Taha, I, I think I got the name right, uh, Taha, um, <clears throat> we also are developing product. We are not a service company. And so the product that we have is owned by us. So by doing these proof of concepts, by doing these pilots, we can test so that at some point, when the quantum computers are capable, they can then run these proof of concepts at an industrial scale. I'll give you one example of a very important pilot project. It's a big pilot project. It's worth millions and millions of pounds. We are working with the BBC in the United Kingdom in taking language processing to scale. So instead of doing small pilot projects that are only a few hundred sentences, and these are important, we can then look at stuff which is really industrially scalable. This will take a few years, this will take two years. But that's why if we do this now, then we can become commercial in the future. In cybersecurity, of course, our product is already made, and that is what people are paying revenue for. So we have a mix of things um, that we're doing. But yes, we have revenue. And I like Kareem's uh, uh, reference to uh, uh, ZX. Yeah, Kareem is very good in this. <laughs> very good. Um, yeah, and, and Kareem, you might find the, um, um, the reference to Bob's book. I think it's picturing, you know, diagrammatic processes. It's a very beautiful book. Uh, it, 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 it's a real practical help. Um, if any of you are students and you, I mean, it's, a, it's an expensive book on Amazon, um, but Emma, you know, if I've got 10 books, so if you want me to send you 10 books for your students, I'll send them to you. Send me an email later. You don't have to pay. You don't have to pay for them. I'll just send them to you. Thank it's you very, know. very beautiful book. Very good news to the students. <laughs> so uh, I have a, a question for myself. Uh, so what about the products uh, you have right now? Uh, you mean we, when we sell products to customer? So do the customer have to work on quantum computer or we, we produce a solution on a quantum computer and they use it classically? So, so we produce classical. So, so the, only, the only product currently available, well, there's a hardware which could be a product. There are companies such as uh, IBM. There are companies uh, such as IQM in Finland, um, OQC, Oxford Quantum in Britain, um, in the United States, companies such as uh, Rigetti. They have computers and they try and sell computers. So that's a product. And in that case, obviously, the buyer has to know what to do with it. Right. Then I think in your case, you're really talking about the software product. Yes. And in that area, there really is only one product, which is cybersecurity. These yes. are the keys. So that one, you don't need to have a quantum computer. We will give you the key. And the key has already been seeded non-deterministically. And so you can use the key without having a quantum computer. Very good. In the so other you are area, selling classical software generated by quantum algorithms. Absolutely. Oh, this is very good. Absolutely, very good. absolutely. So, but, why but, did you decide? In, in the in the future, I I would expect that products in optimization, you know, using machine learning, products in quantum chemistry for uh, for computational chemistry, I think these will be products where they're cloud delivered. So you yourself don't need to have a quantum computer. You can access just like you do at the moment with high performance computers, 
and you'll be able to access these and benefit from these um, enterprise level software and you'll be able to do so by paying a subscription or a service fee which incorporates access to the machine so i think that this will emerge but i don't think it's going to emerge very soon i think we're still a year or two or three possibly four depending upon the product we could wake up, you know, I mean, somebody secretly may have a quantum computer that they didn't tell us about uh, and it can do all these things, but I, I think not yet. So uh, I, I have another question. Um, um, uh, what about, uh, uh, um, uh, I, I don't know how to rephrase it. Um, Maybe, maybe I, 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 if we have another question, I, I will try to rephrase the question in my mind. Then I will ask. So if anyone has any question, please write it down or you can raise your hands. I, well, one thing I would just say to Kareem, Kareem, if you do on the internet search, you seem to be very good at this. There is a video on YouTube of Bob Cook um, talking about quantum natural language processing and he, oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah we we and yeah, he we, goes we. through the he goes through the actual um algorithm and the implementation and why mm -hmm. it is quantum native that might be interesting for your colleagues okay uh give me a second yeah yeah take your time you'll find it i'm sure so i think Ali has a question with reference to, yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, well, this is a big question, you know, uh, Emma, this is a very big question. So first of all, I'm the chairman of the Topos Foundation, T-O-P-O-S. And the mission of the Topos Foundation is to make sure that we all, not just a few um, um, middle-class white people in a country like Europe, in a European country or whatever, benefits from these things. We want to democratize um, this. And when we say democratize, we want to have technology for the public good. And in order for that to happen, we have to have a transparency in the way that decisions are made by AI. And we have to have accountability. And we also have to be able to understand why something a result, shall we say, or a measurement or a, a phrase has become used. Now, in language processing, gender bias, race bias, and all these things are, are coming to play at the moment. And a quantum natural language processing program, which is based on the technology, which is quantum native, which could be compositional intelligence, will allow us to avoid these mistakes and will allow us to be transparent. Now, this is a big, big, big statement, and it's one that I think is very necessary because it shifts the paradigm of AI. And this is something I'm, I'm very excited about. I don't know whether it's one year or I don't know whether it's two years or whether it's five years away, but it will happen very quickly. Um, Emma, that one is a very old one. Um, um, that's very, very old. That's five years ago. It, there's, a, there's a video which is 2021. You'll find it. And you're right. It is the, the, the language of category theory is, of course, the motivator for this um, particular discipline. Uh, and of course, category theory has been around since the 1950s. Uh, well, earlier as well, but but particularly the 50s. But this 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 basis, the, you know, the categoric uh, applied category theory is definitely uh, a modern offshoot of where this has all come from. And it is fascinating. It's intellectually very. It has great integrity. Let's put it that way. 
I think Karim. I believe Karim will find the recent one. Yes, yes, he's, yes. He's will. very good in this. <laughs> so maybe Ahmed, you can ask me your last question because I. Oh have yeah. To... Okay. Uh, why why did you decide to adopt or to go for the trapped ions quantum computer? Do you think trapped ions is better than superconducting? Oh no no. I th I think that um, no. I don't think anybody knows which one is going to be the best. Eventually, we don't know. We have no idea. Um, I think. The, the the answer to your question is that uh, is that I think that the it is possible that certain types of quantum computers might be better for certain types of tasks. They might be calibrated more easily. And then as far as a trapped iron device is concerned, I think the real question should be why did we choose to merge with the Honeywell company, which has the H series um, computer? Of course, now we are merged and it is one company, it's called Continuum. I think the answer to that question is that we are heavy users. We were heavy users of the uh, of the device and we found it to be the best performer right now. And it can accelerate what we're doing, particularly in material discovery in the area of quantum chemistry. And we believe that that area really affects humanity more quickly than other areas of quantum computing. And we think in the long term, a trapped iron device will be one of the most important ways of generating and manipulating and measuring qubits in the area of material discovery, first principles material discovery. And that, that belief is there today as well. It was there when we first started and it is there. I think later on this year, we'll be announcing some major, major advances. Um, we've already been the first company to get to um, the highest quantum volume. We're the first company to do dynamic uh, error correction, i.e. not post-processing. We're the first company that is also um, uh, exhibiting these logical qubits with very low overhead. So, you know, these are big advances. OK, thank you very much. So Karim has a question. Um, if you have time. Um... Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Yes, Karim, go ahead. OK, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, you mentioned that um, uh, Continuum uh, or Continuum actually uh, is working with a uh, photonic uh, provider. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, can you disclose the name and why uh, did you choose um, like a photonic backend? for a certain type of application? Well, it, uh, this, uh, well, uh, let me do the second part first. You know, we're in the early stages, Kareem, of the development of quantum computing as an industry, uh -huh. and there's a lot of collaboration going on. Um, it's, it's normal. And remember, Ticket, our um, software development kit, is very widely used. And because it's open source, people feel comfortable it's like the early Linux days, I guess, you know, so we are approached by a lot of people to collaborate. Um, I can't at the moment um, disclose the names. I'm really sorry. We're, we're, we're under strict NDA. But what I can tell you is that it's a very exciting area. It's uh -huh. It's got its own challenges, Kareem, because mm -hmm. of the um, um, handling qubits that are photon that are photons is uh, <laughs> is not easy, but um, but it's very exciting. Okay, uh, another another important question. Um, uh, the last answer that you said, uh, you talked about that uh, Honeywell's hardware can actually be extremely performant uh, in quantum chemistry. So uh, is it because that the ion traps are like like have a better fidelity over, you know, over the course of adding mini gates, you know, or consecutive gates, or because of the the higher quantum volume that they possess, or uh, is there another metric that you actually focus on when you decide which is better for quantum chemistry? Well, I mean, this is obviously now we could spend a lot of time on. It's a really good question. It's a very well educated question. I think that the the current um, fidelity of the trapped iron qubits and the ability to create these uh, mid-circuit measurements as well as dynamic error correction allows us 
to have an integrated approach where the, the machine can be calibrated very easily. We're doing, for example, with Honeywell itself, a project in refrigerants. And that is something which is very valuable in these early days if we're going to create genuine products. So it's a combination of many different things, Kareem, rather than one particular thing. And then generically, what I would say, I'm very respectful of these superconductors. I think that the early um, debate between superconducting and trapped ion devices is a bit of a false debate. As I said earlier, I think it's likely that superconducting um, quantum processes might end up being used in a hybrid manner with trapped ion devices, and then we get to a final result. I really, truly believe that, Kareem, uh, and I don't know whether we're a year away or three years away, but I can see a true hybrid system where there's classical superconducting and trapped ion devices being used to look at different parts of a problem. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, but finally, uh, Ahmed, I, my last point. Um, if any of your people are interested in um, a, a remote uh, internship um, with CQ, especially if they are um, post uh, graduate, um, you know, either doing a PhD or a master's or beyond, then please get in touch with me um, through you and we would be delighted to see if we can assist. I'm very keen to make sure that, you know, we speak to a wide audience of future, you know, future geniuses. Maybe the this board is, this was... Is very, asking, very uh, generous offer. Thank you very much. I think my students will be very happy with this. Thank yeah, we'd love much. to help. I really would. I really would. So I think Taha, um, um, uh, I don't know if you had, you raised your voice, your, your hand. So if you want to, yeah. to yeah, ask thanks. your question. Yeah, uh, thanks a, a lot uh, for uh, this uh, nice, uh, for this nice event. I was just wondering because now we are trying to like uh, like uh, have the first steps in molecular simulations using quantum algorithms. And uh, we always have that question. Uh, are there is like enough capacity in the market for uh, molecular simulations or the market more adapting quantum technology for like finance and uh, encryption, uh, cyber security more than uh, molecular applications? You, Daha, this is, uh, you're asking the wrong person because I have no objectivity here. I'm totally biased. You know, um, in a hundred years time, nobody's going to care about a better cybersecurity system. Nobody's going to care about some stupid, you know, finance application. But if we cure Alzheimer's, if we cure carbon sequestration, if we find a solution to nitrogen fixation, if we can get the photovoltaic process better, these things affect humanity for the next thousand years and the planet. It's way, way, way more important. Now, Today, the system that you and I live in, the world that we live in, obviously places value on product in some of these areas. And of course, it's valuable in generating a particular type of revenue for a particular type of problem. And yes, there will be very lucrative use cases. But if you ask me what's more important, I'm in the Feynman camp. You know, simulating quantum processes or simulating a quantum system, I should say, in order to be able to design uh, new materials, this is big. And, and language processing and, and AI is big. You know, what happens if you have a device that actually understands nuance and jokes and intonation? Now, along the way, the application of these technologies uh, you mentioned finance for finance, etc. Of course, these will be interesting and fortunes will be made and companies will be very successful. But fundamentally, you know, feeding the human population, make, keeping it safe and protecting our planet and enjoying longevity. And, you know, these things are much more profound in my in my personal opinion. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for for uh, for the clear answer. And thanks a lot uh, for answering all questions.
<laughs> no, you're welcome, young man. You're more than welcome. OK, my friends in Alexandria, I'm going now. Ahmed, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much for your time and for this very nice talk. Uh, it's really, really interesting. Um, and I hope to get in touch with you soon. Um, and thank you very much books? for everything. I, I have the ten books, and I'm okay. waiting. For, I'm waiting for an internship. So please follow up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eli. Thank you very much, and see you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. I'll stop the recording right now. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So meeting is over.